Well, good evening, everybody. <laughs> um, my name is Matt Holloway. I'm uh, co-chair of the Amherst Cultural Council, and I want to welcome folks to a special meeting of the Amherst Cultural Council. Um, this is an accessibility roundtable event. Um, and because this may be a public meeting of a public body done over virtual means, I'm going to read a, um, a little script that we have from the Attorney General's office, um, which simply says that um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting is being conducted via remote means. Um, members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so obviously on Zoom right now. Um, however, the meeting will also be recorded and posted prominently on the Amherst Cultural Council website. So folks who do not attend um, can certainly access it uh, there as well. Um, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time, being technological means. Um, and if folks have any questions about any of that, we, we can certainly help you um, just email acc at amherstmass, uh, amherstma.gov. That's acc at amherstmass.gov. Um, and then with that, I'm just going to turn the, turn the conversation over. I'm going to introduce Charles Baldwin, uh, who is the program officer for the Mass Cultural Council's Universal Participation Initiative, UPI, or UP which provides professional development and universal design practices for cultural organizations seeking to move access from a regulatory obligation to a policy for inclusive community engagement. And Charles, this has been an area we've been working hard on for the past couple of years, and we're just so delighted to have you here with us. And um, I can't wait to turn it over to you and, and hear what you have to share. Uh very happy to have been invited. Um, I know there's not a, a lot of people in the room, but um, for uh, folks who are, uh, again, my name is Charles Baldwin. I am the program officer for UP at the Mass Cultural Council. Uh, for folks who might just be listening in, I'm an older white gentleman with a gray beard, red glasses, and a trim mohawk. Uh, and I am calling in from Somerville, uh, which are the unceded lands of the Massachusetts Nipmuc and Wampanoag peoples, a very rich area over here in Somerville. There used to be a lot more water, so I think that uh, had a lot to do with it. I'm really pleased to talk a little bit about uh, access. Um, I know that uh, we worked last year to really put language into the criteria of the grants. And I think sometimes the, uh, the ADA and certainly the list of regulations can sort of freeze people and, and bring out uh, anxiety uh, as opposed to uh, this, this goal of really uh, of uh, creating an embrace of all the variety of our humanists. So uh, I do have a little presentation and we'll talk a little bit about the ADA, but mostly I want to explore both the, the do-it-yourself efforts as well as the capital campaigns and everything in between that really can help um, organizations who are developing programs to really think about access and access from the start. It is always so much easier to include it in the beginning when you're in the brainstorming or scripting phase than to kind of try to apply it after a program has been designed. And so hopefully this will help a little bit. Um, I said uh, I'm available for a follow up uh, and certainly throughout the presentation, which sometimes is brief, depending on how wordy I get, uh, feel free to uh, raise a hand, ask a question. Um, the bulk of the slides really become launching points for stories uh, around successful or unsuccessful access practices. Um, and hopefully we can learn from both. So, sound good? Great, all right. Let's get this to be full screen. There we go. All righty. So um, up for universal participation. Uh, this includes an image of Elise Patterson, who is the executive director of Abilities Dance. Uh, Elise Patterson, uh, based on uh, her life and her uh, conditions, sometimes uses a wheelchair, sometimes uses a walker, 
sometimes uses a cane and sometimes doesn't use anything at all. And this has led to Elise being called not disabled enough. I'm just gonna let that land there and we'll carry on. Uh, briefly, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, of course, as you are familiar, is the state agency that reinvests your tax dollars into the cultural sector, really uh, part of the economic, the creative economy here in our state, which of course, if people read the Globe yesterday, we know has seen a huge, huge economic hit uh, based on the uh, COVID, the sheltering, and the need for health protocols to sort of for us to navigate them and for them to settle into our everyday lives. Uh, but what is UP? Um, UP is a program that provides both learning and grants. Um, if I'm speaking state talk, I say things like systems evaluation and transformation that anticipates and responds to humans providing choice and opportunity. But it really is an opportunity, it really is a program that uh, again is thinking about access as an action, not just as something that goes into a mission statement uh, and it's really human centered. Uh, I've included here a picture from uh, the 1990s protests for access to public transportation. A number of people are on the front line, including Judy Human, who is still with us and quite uh, famous. Uh, they are under a banner uh, with the quote by Martin Luther Jr. by Martin Luther King Jr. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Alongside this uh, image are the four characteristics that we look for when thinking about folks and organizations joining the Universal Participation Initiative, which are vision, education, representation, and innovation how you respond to those really lets us know where you are on the spectrum of understanding. Uh, the UP initiative is one that uh, you may be competitive, but everybody gets in. Um, I'm gonna briefly talk about statistics um, because it does, uh, the numbers certainly contribute to uh, why this is important. Although since this is a human centered movement, uh, humans are number one. Um, but statistics show us that one in five Americans identify as having a disability. In urban areas, that's often one in four. 13% um, of youth between the ages of three and 21, and we're seeing a rise in brain-based disabilities in our youth. Um, the silver tsunami, which of course is the uh, aging population and the baby boomers uh, hitting the 65 mark, 50% of adults 65 and older have disabilities and 10,000 people are turning 65 every day. Now I've included on this slide uh, two images uh, referring to the international symbol of disability. On the top is the stick figure in the wheeled device. This has become uh, not only very popular, but world renowned. It has done what some logos can't do, but it really identifies disability in a single image. The lower image is the gorilla image designed by Sarah Hendren and her college students. Uh, this is a gorilla image. It is not used by the federal government. It's not recognized by states or towns, but it does show this sticked figure with a little bit more action leaning forward as if moving quickly uh, to remind us that not everyone in a wheeled device is slow and sometimes they are quite quick. I like to include these images on this slide because as we look at uh, disability or the disabling qualities in an everyday life, many of them are not, um, un are not embodied in the graphic that has become uh, quite renowned and quite well known. The uh, most common reasons for adult functional limitations are arthritis, back problems, heart disease, respiratory disease. And again, these are not encompassed in these images, but this is the image that we have uh, that is working. I believe they're going to be looking at new designs for this, but it's important when we think about disability, which is a small word that encompasses a large population of people that includes both identities it includes 
uh, conditions that are temporary. It includes behaviors. Um, it includes the invisible disabilities, brain-based, cognitive, neurological, uh, and these are all encompassed under the word disability, but perhaps not embodied in the very successful image. Briefly, people with disabilities, uh, one, most of us are without disabilities temporarily. And if you really start thinking about the spectrum of ability, you recognize that uh, we are all on it. Uh, I do not identify as a person with a disability, but I do identify as old. And aging is one of the number one disabling qualities in a life. I move, think, hear, and see differently at this age than I did 40 years ago. And I love this image of the, the astronaut in outer space because in outer space, everyone is disabled. And by design, this suit that we see allows this human to exist in a very inhumane environment. So this is a reminder that uh, when we, instead of thinking about people, we're thinking about environments. So that disability is actually that point where the human meets the world. That's what becomes disabling. And with that, I've also included my version of the D, the E, and the I with the A, uh, an acronym that can spell out idea, but inclusion as an action not just as a, a, a something of the mind, but an active verb. Uh, diversity is really uh, the world around you in all reality. It's an acknowledgement of the real world right now today. Equity, which is about fairness, it's different than equality. It is about uh, uh, distribution in a fair manner. So equity becomes an aspirational point and access that is achievable by design. Now, uh, universal design is a uh, practice, uh, really is the disability lens on design. Um, there are seven principles, but uh, I'm a fan of the eight goals as designed by Edward Steinfeld and his crew at the University of Buffalo. And while it includes these uh, aspects of design that can accommodate a multitude of bodies, things like body fit and comfort and awareness, uh, what the eight uh, goals have also is cultural appropriateness, which I think is important as we're reaching out and thinking beyond a traditional white Euro-centered person with a disability, but recognizing the disabling natures of racism, sexism, uh, as well as classism. Um, and it also talks about social integration and the importance to treat people with dignity and respect. I'm not gonna go into universal design for learning, but this is a brain-based practice, taking universal design one step further, taking it into the brain. It is often used in classrooms as a way to understand that people learn and take in information in different ways. This is again, brain-based practice. And by understanding how people take in information, you can provide a more successful student. And that, of course, is the goal in school, to have our young people succeed in school. I like to bring universal design to learning to folks who are in marketing departments and development departments, because it does talk about information. And I'm also not here to be the expert on the ADA. Uh, there are people who are that. Um, I'm also not the ADA police. Uh, I am. Uh, there are certain uh, obligations uh, that you need to be held accountable to, but uh, I am more of an encourager. The idea that obligations are baseline. The work that I am hoping to steward is one that is creative and expansive and really embraces our very regular atypical humanity. But I'm going to pick out three things from the ADA, which are kind of abstract, but allow for a deeper look. Um, the phrase is reasonable accommodations, which asks us what is reasonable. Uh, integrated settings, which is often the goal, but not always. And effective communication, because what is effective for me may not be effective for you. These are kind of nuanced terms. So often activism, activists will think the only way to make things change is through litigation. So I'm here to say we can make change one step at a time, but what's important is to make that first step. 
and when to do it is now. So I'm going to provide a couple of ideas around achieving access that is both um, small and incremental and big and grand. Um, and again, some of these things can be nuanced. So uh, I will go through them. And uh, if there are questions, if there are ideas, if this percolates something, please uh, do let me know. Um, but the number one most affordable access feature that you can have is a staff that is informed and empowered. That attitudinal shift can be one of the harder things to break. The biases that we have towards people with disabilities, the infantilism that often happens with people uh, when they're dealing with folks with disabilities, the pity that might come forth uh, based on all the societal biases. But if you can have a staff that has a good attitude that is informed about what provisions your institution offers, that uh, is welcoming to all humans who show up at the door and empowered to make decisions, that can be the number one most affordable access feature that you can provide. You can go deeper and certainly uh, for those of you who are getting money from the state, which often means that you're also getting money from the feds because it's all combined. There are certain obligations and one of those is the ADA coordinator, someone who's central to your business practice, your institutional practice, who can do the research, answer the questions, and also touch multiple departments so that the entire institution is informed. Um, I think that uh, when we're talking about language, which is ever dynamic and ever changing, that their default can often be the person first language. See the person, not the disability. See the person, not the color. See the person. This is human centered work. But obviously, as you get to know people, that's all going to change. Again, this is the nuance. Um, but there are some positions that you can take to be more respectful and to really create that, uh, that first step into a welcoming environment. You'll note that I put transactional or transformational. This is, I think, a challenge for many organizations when thinking about patronage. Access certainly can increase your patronage, but access is on both sides or all sides of an institution. It's not just about the patron. So what are the environments that you're creating? And is your relationship more than the transaction, the monetary transaction? Um, Additionally, uh, when you're thinking about customer service, you do want to have uh, what the ADA will, uh, protocols might call a grievance procedure. I like to think of it as more of a response. How do you respond to queries, complaints, concerns, suggestions? Sometimes that could be conflict negotiation, but again, you want to have somebody who knows the answers. And as I like to say, always says yes, or at least yes and, yes but. Yes, in just a moment. Uh, effective communication. Again, another nuanced term in the ADA. Here I have an image that is uh, used by a fair that was held by Mass Audubon. Um, it has several uh, plates that have tactile designs on them. Uh, each of these tactile designs then represents an area of this outdoor fair. So a person by touch is able to know where they are. Um, these are beautiful images. They look like they're on slate, but again, it's the tactile communication that is key in this image. Below the image, I have included a number of logos that are used. When thinking about how you inform people about what services you have, what services you are providing, not only do you wanna provide that in text, but a image can really go a long way in providing a consumer to let them know what services that you might provide. Each of those logos represents uh, different aspects of access. Certainly the first one people should recognize, which is the question mark, which is frequently asked questions. Um, sometimes the first step of access is, uh, how do I get over the anxiety of leaving my apartment, getting off the couch? What are the reasons? And knowing uh, the answers to some basic questions can really help you make that decision. Uh, within this slide, I've also included a number of methods of communication. Um, 
Sometimes it's as easy as creating a large print document or large print labels. Um, and sometimes it can get uh, more complicated and people oriented when you're providing language interpretation. Um, but all of these things become communication techniques and what may be effective for one person may not be effective for the other. So recognizing that the visual, the text, perhaps an audio file, these are all forms of communication and you sometimes need to provide pieces and everything to really be effective. Now, because I work in Access, I do tend to get this request a lot. Where can I find ASL interpretation? Where can I find the ASL interpreters? And certainly in the call for equity that has really been ramping up over the last couple of years, there has been a greater need for the interpreter. Um, I'm just going to pose a question and let it land, uh, but which comes first, the person or the accommodation? In the context of language interpretation, people are providing that reasonable accommodation. People are providing the translation or the interpretation. But I think it's always important to start with the person whose language this is. So in the context of this slide showing the two hands that represent ASL interpretation, I would start with the person who is deaf, who uses ASL authentically um, before I would uh, start putting an interpreter on the side. And this is tough because obviously an interpreter is going to compel hopefully people who are deaf who are ASL users to come to your event. But um, it's something to think about when you are thinking about integration of English and ASL in your program. Uh, another note, uh, more and more in performance settings, when thinking about having a, a theatrical or concert performance uh, interpreted, uh, people are really centering the deaf user of ASL, the authentic user of ASL. And uh, that would be the director of ASL or the coordinator of ASL so that the language interpretation comes from an authentic user of that language. The director of ASL then would hire the interpreters uh, and rehearse the interpretation so that it becomes the best interpretation possible. And this is where connecting with directors and designers and touching upon the themes that the production team is wanting to express through a production, uh, this is why having people involved at the very beginning is so very important. How you include interpretation, whether that's static over stage left, shadowing based on having uh, voice interpreters behind ASL performers or vice versa, um, establishing zones. This is all to help an audience member not to have to ping pong between the language they uh, understand and the language that's being used and the visuals that are being used on stage. And of course, uh, ASL interpretation, if you are using it in a production setting, you want to remember uh, backstage, front of house, talkbacks, et cetera. Uh, integrated settings is one of the goals of the ADA. The idea is, again, to have us all together. Uh, this image shows uh, a picture from an event that was developed by uh, VSA Mass, now known as Open Door Arts Massachusetts. Uh, it's called Inclusive by Design. Uh, this is actually a riff over um, Jazz Art Signs, which is a process that Lisa Thorson, a uh, pianist from the Berklee College of Music established, which is to provide a musical performance that is interpreted visually by a painter, interpreted into American Sign Language by an interpreter, and also includes an open audio description of what is occurring. So obviously, mostly we think of ASL interpreters as interpreting English language. In this context, they are interpreting the music. And description when used in a performance setting is often a verbal description of key visual elements choreographed into a production. Uh, generally, it's heard by the person who wants this service. And so it's often on a, a receiver that's a, you know, a radio receiver. But in this case, 
all people hear it. I was doing some work with the Boston Children's Museum, where again, the average age of the patron is three years old. And uh, they had someone come in wanting to audio describe one of their performances for kids. And they handed them a series of receivers. And we both got to laughing because which three-year-old is gonna sit there with headsets and a radio listening to an audio description? So it was decided to make the audio description of the performance a little bit more of a narration, and that would then be an open description that all people would hear. Um, so again, while the goal might be integrated settings, uh, there are times when uh, populations of people actually want specific settings. Often these are language-based, and we'll talk a little bit in the future, uh, in a future slide about relaxed performances or performances that have been modified uh, under the umbrella of being more accessible to people with autism. Um, but it's important to include digital access. Uh, you do not want to forget your websites and you do not want to forget your social media. Uh, websites so importantly are of course the front door to many institutions. Um, uh, invitations, uh, registrations. These are all things that are sent through these digital platforms. And digital access means um, if I use a screen reader, is this still accessible to me? If I do not have manual dexterity, can I use the keyboard and simply the function keys to navigate through your website? Do your photos all include alt text? Do your videos all include captions? Um, this information uh, is through the Web Consortium Accessibility Guidelines. We're actually at 2.2 now. My slide still says 2.1. Um, but uh, you can find a lot of this information on the web. But this is about, again, creating websites that are accessible um, to all people. I was doing some work with folks in the medical field, and their goal was to make websites uh, intuitive and responsive. Uh, and as we know, multiple ages respond to the digital environments in multiple ways. So you need to be prepared for all sorts of people who may be coming to your website. I like to include this one, uh, this slide called provide auxiliary aids, because sometimes we get lost in the technology. And sometimes as the graphic shows, it could be as simple as having a paper and a pencil so that someone who does not speak English is able to provide a written note or an image that will help. Uh, we also know that in many environments, the questions are always the same. How long is this? Where's the bathroom? Can I get a snack? Where's the trash? Um, so within this, thinking about the different auxiliary aids, that's everything from pen and paper to uh, the amplified sound devices as described earlier, but it also touches upon real devices that people may use. You need to be prepared um, for folks who use mobility devices, and that's everything from a manual wheelchair to a Segway. Uh, I have included, and of course, I've also spent much time on service animals. Like the wheeled device, the service animal is allowed on your site, but it would be best to really start thinking about policies around pets and emotional support animals, currently not protected under the ADA, uh, but state and federal rules often differ. You, uh, housing in Massachusetts does support the inclusion of emotional support animals, but the ADA is specifically around service animals, service animals who have been trained to provide a service for the person with a disability. They do not need to wear a vest, they do not need a certificate, uh, but they have been trained to perform a distinct skill. And of course, when we think about access, always people think about physical access. Uh, as noted earlier, I didn't say I was an ADA expert, but it does help, like the website, to know what questions to ask. So uh, if you are in the, you're, you're improving a facility, you're adding to the facility. Uh, the Massachusetts Architectural Advisory Board will have a lot of obligations you have to meet, but again, always wanting to get above and beyond mere obligations. When I think about physical access, I think about a couple of things. One, wayfinding and mapping getting around an outdoor festival, getting around a neighborhood. It's more than just signage. There are visual cues to be thinking of, color cues that you can add. So wayfinding is its own distinct piece. 
Uh, the other is risk management and emergency preparedness. Uh, for those of you who have venues or houses, the idea of being sure that people with disabilities are included in any emergency planning. If you're planning an outdoor festival, uh, where do people go if some kind of emergency or medical uh, comes up? And when thinking about the physical environment beyond architecture, I always think about slopes, surfaces, threshold, counters, seating, banisters, acoustics. So there's lots of different pieces to this. Uh, as noted, the relaxed performance, this is a performance uh, a lot of different uh, folks uh, are really thinking about the relaxed or modified performance. Uh, originally designed by the Theater Development Fund uh, around the Lion King, coming out of some of the work that had been done in Britain. Uh, I use the term relaxed performance as opposed to sensory sensitivities or an autism friendly performance. The relaxed performance then, like many of the features that I'm talking about, create opportunities and choices for people. They may have been designed thinking about a distinct population, but you wanna create, you wanna get beyond thinking that the relaxed performance is for this type of person and more about by providing this modified performance, uh, performance that has taken out maybe some of the bright lights, some of the, uh, reduce some of the louder sounds, that this creates an environment that many people might enjoy for a variety of reasons. And while noting that um, the integrated experience is one that the ADA is really trying to compel us forward to uh, experience, that sometimes uh, in the case of the behaviors that sometimes exhibit uh, with young people and adults with autism, that in this environment, people wanna feel safe and comfortable if there's additional noises or people moving about. Um, and this is where uh, creating a space that will work um, is one that becomes more and more important as uh, uh, our, our human variety and our human needs become more specific. Uh, one of the things, uh, I worked for a theater for many years and this theater was radically inclusive. And I say radical, it shouldn't have been, but it was considered thus. And we always had a uh, variety, you know, we were the first theater to uh, always interpret our productions in American Sign Language. We brought audio description into Boston. Uh, we open captioned every single performance. So this relaxed performance idea seemed like a great one. And we did two of those performances, but not a lot of people came. And so we surveyed, you know, responsive. We surveyed our, our audience to say what was up. And what we found is that the performance that we thought was designated for people, that we had already created an environment where folks were already coming. They didn't need a special performance. They were already felt welcome. Marvelous response. Super happy to hear that we were creating an environment that anyone could come to. And what we did instead of creating more relaxed performances was to provide uh, a deeper know before you go social narrative to make sure that our staff was trained to recognize a variety of people, that there were quiet zones and fidget toys available at all performances, and that our partnerships were really critical for creating uh, new audiences in this environment. And lastly, over the last couple of years, really thinking about the essential nature of what access can provide. Uh, there's definitely an emerging vocabulary about disability aesthetics. Uh, if you've attended a dance performance by Alice Shepard, or I mentioned Elise Patterson at the beginning of the program, we are now developing a new vocabulary for dance and movement. Um, uh, the UP program was able to fund an after-school program for kids who are blind, led by a woman who was deaf blind in photography wasn't up for me to decide who gets to use a camera and who doesn't. But the images that they created, it was so important for these young people, like everyone else, to have a camera, to take photos and be able to share those. I also think that as we're thinking about strategic partnerships and thinking about access, that the impact of uh, 
the barriers that people experience day to day, we can't think of our sites as isolated bastions of culture. We have to recognize the connection uh, between these other social services. So when thinking about food and water, housing and transportation, medical health and wellness, these are things that our cultural institutions, our cultural projects need to be aware of. Uh, certainly technological literacy, who has Wi-Fi, who doesn't, particularly in this world now where so much is spent in the digital environment. Um, and I've also included pace in there because I do think, and I'm sure many of you are feeling it, it's April and spring is here and summer is coming and we're gonna be outdoors and the pace of everything is really ramping up. And sometimes you really need to pause you want to make sure that you're as healthy and as strong as possible so that you can serve and uh, contribute as much as possible. So when I think about what is essential, um, this is a slight shift. We've all found the last couple of years very disabling. People are more aware of mental health, the effects of isolation. So thinking about our creative practices as ways to combat that, I think is one way to consider access as an essential activity. Uh, this is the really the last slide and I've included this one because uh, PJ Moynihan and Digital Eyes is located in Amherst and he worked with Valerie over at the Institute for Human Centered Design in creating a film on their report. So the changing reality of disability in America is a pretty extensive report began in 2019 came out in 2020. Uh, PJ Monahan turned it into a 30 minute film, which you can get on the homepage of the Institute for Human Centered Design. But it really is touching upon this idea, uh, this switch, rather than thinking about people as disabled, thinking about environments as disabling and starting to look at age and chronic conditions, uh, trauma and stress and how that can contribute to the barriers that we experience homelessness and behavioral health. It's a great little report and I think it's worth looking at as we're really thinking beyond disability, but really embracing access as an active verb to really create opportunities for everyone to participate in whatever programs we're designing. I've got a couple of resources and happy to have any of these shared. And then number one policy, as always, is nothing about us without us. Uh, I've had the privilege and the honor to work with so many artists and put them at the podium. All of this work comes and stands on their shoulders. Uh, I am hoping to alleviate the burden of uh, artists having to both be a teacher and a producer, and sometimes they just wanna create. And so if I can help eliminate this first barrier, uh, I've done my job. And that's what I've got. So, so thank you very much, Charles. That's really an amazing, um, amazing body of content. And I feel again just very grateful to have your, uh, to have your presence with us here today. Um, <laughs> I definitely have about uh, several questions for you written down, but I, I guess. Rather than, rather than jump right into that, I'd, I'd like to kind of um, set the stage for the discussion a little bit. Uh, we do have a number of cultural council members um, in the meeting now. Uh, and then we have several folks in the audience as well uh, on, the, on the audience side. And those folks, um, I believe, should be able to raise their hand. And if they'd like to enter the, um, the round table now, we'd, we'd love to have you. Or you, if you're more comfortable hanging out in the audience, that's totally fine as well. Um, and I just want to say, Ricardo, these links that you're putting in the chat are really fabulous. And, and I'm going to ask Ricardo, and we have Charles's slides as well. So, so we'll post this recording and Charles's slides. And also, Ricardo, if you don't mind, when we're done emailing me those links, we'll post all of that on the ACC website so we can preserve all these great, <clears throat> all these great artifacts that, that y'all are sharing with us. Um, and I guess, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to hold off on my questions and, and see if others want to, but I, I do want to just make one sort of um, plant one seed before we jump in, into the discussion. And that's that, you know, for, for cultural councils, when you're allocating your grant funds, you have the option of doing council programs. Um, and so 
over the past couple of years, as we've worked on accessibility topics, we've had in mind the idea of doing a, a, an accessibility event. Um, and so, so the ACC, the Amherst Cultural Council, did put aside some funds to conduct an actual um, an event with guest speakers and potentially, you know, I, I'm thinking out loud here a little bit, but but possible in person, possibly hybrid, you know. But so we we would um, be interested in uh, in ideas about something to do in the fall that um, you know that, that kind of takes some of the learning that we've started with you here today, Charles, and and takes it a few steps further and. Um, I guess you know my big my big thought is is what what can we do to make <laughs> to make accessibility content accessible to you know to our grantees to our to our artists and and creators and cultural entities um, because you know I think some folks get get intimidated by this and I and I appreciate your focus on um, depth rather than compliance when it comes to accessibility thinking and and when it comes to um, this kind of work but. But I also know that you know, for for some artists and some cultural folks, there is that creative impulse, um, and and so some folks are still struggling with you know, how do I make how do I make what I make uh, accessible accessible and still authentically make that thing that I make. And so, um, I think the more that we can engender dialogue around that topic, um, the better. So, and, and I'm going to jump in, Matt, because I think. That is such a actually a key piece, and I'm thrilled to see Robin here. And I I can't wait for Robin you Mike. to have, <laughs> have objections to my to my approach. <laughs> but it's the it's the it's the, so often the dialogue that is important. My whole thing is make that first step, knowing that you're going to make the second step, the third step, the fourth step. The pace is yours, but the whole idea is to improve over time. Um, I got a lot of folks one year um, concerned that uh, the ADA was going to require them to pave the trail uh, through their mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and that's not the, that isn't the goal, but to provide a description of the trail mm -hmm. so that people then can choose. Oh, I can handle a, an old dirt road with a couple of hills, but maybe I can't do a single track rocky path up the mountain. Uh, but the picnic table at the base of it actually does have an area for myself and my grandmother who uses a wheelchair so we can sit and eat while the kids go up the mountain. So it's really so much of it is a candid assessment to start with so that you know what your baseline is. So then then again, what my first step might be different than Robin's first step would be different than your first step based on both human and financial capacity. But the key thing is the first step. And that first step has to happen, as I like to say, yesterday, but I'll say tomorrow. Enjoy. And Joy, it's great to see you as well. And Joy, I want to just take a second and acknowledge all of your hard work in um, really putting this together and, and taking the lead on, on this event. Um, I feel I feel lucky to work with you, and and um, you know I know it's been a, a busy couple of days for for you, but um, we're we're thrilled to see you here as well. And one thing that Joy's done, I, I won't speak for her, but she's certainly pushed our envelope in terms of expanding. When we think access, we don't just think disability, and she's really helped us um, drive that conversation this year. And and so uh, we're really just grateful for you all. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry for being late again. Um... Yeah, Charles, that was uh, given us a lot to think about um, in terms of not just uh, disability. And, you know, I've been trying to get people to think of this as, as inclusion is not about figuring out how to get disabled people in. It's about figuring it's it's figuring out how to get everybody access. Right. So um, I really and, and, you know, thank you for for going with with that approach because i think that's a difficult concept to grasp for for some people and it's like you know i remember when you and i had this first conversation about even this panel we were like okay should we have an asl interpreter and you were like do you have deaf attendees and it's like okay let me get back to you on that. <laughs> well and and that's a tough one because you know Obviously, if there's an interpreter, and again, so I'm, I'm going to say the Mass Cultural Council is on this journey too, figuring out 
uh, when to have the interpreter and when to not. And they're currently basing it on numbers. You know, if your meeting hits 50, we'll automatically have a captioner. And if your meeting hits 100, we'll automatically include an ASL interpreter. And that's great. However, uh, the work that I do based on, uh, again, it's inclusion of everybody, but it's specifically not excluding people with disabilities. That's sometimes what gets lost in this let's include everybody conversation is that that gets left behind. And so although I may not have an ASL interpreter at every single class that I offer, um, I had it at the kickoff because I had Monique Holt from Gallaudet do the keynote. I had this fantastic deaf artist theater panel where I was able to get an interpreter per artist so that the hearing people in the audience realized the accommodation was the voice interpretation for them, mm -hmm. as opposed to the other way around. Robin, I got to get send you the transcript. It was so that, great. I would love to see it was that. Hot. It was so hot. That is so cool. So I, I've got a couple of things from what Joy was saying, not just access for everybody to attend, but access for everybody to be able to tell, let's say, their story. Right. Or give their whatever that is, whether it's written, theater, music, whatever. So right now we're mostly having, you know, people who supposedly don't need any access. And then we're, if there are other people trying to provide access, but not other people telling their story, not a dancer in a wheelchair telling their story, not a deaf musician. And there are deaf musicians, not, you know, all of that. So, and I keep saying this and I, and I'm not sure how to drive that, actually. The other thing is when you said, oh, well, there, are you going to have a deaf attendant in terms of the signer? For me, that's not the only reason to have an ASL interpreter. It's to make it so it's the norm um, so that people who might need or want to have a I'm not quite sure the language, uh, someone doing ASL interpreting um, so realizes, oh, this group is doing this. I can, you know, I can put this on my ideas of where to go and what to do. And I don't necessarily have to call and find out and make sure that it's there. But also for the other people who, to change our reference points of what's the norm and of who participates, um, I think sometimes that's a more important thing to learn than, um, I'm not sure if the terms, but sometimes I don't think it, it, on certain levels matters if there's someone in the audience reading ASL, because there will be eventually if we do it as a normal thing. Um, and, and and I'm so glad you're in the room today, Robin, because of course, as I was saying that, I was like, we've oh, talked about this much. Exactly. Much, so. uh, Robin's <laughs> going to call me out on this. Well, but, no, I'm calling out. But, but adding I think that that's a real thing. If, if there's something that's consistent, so the mm -hmm. person who uses this language knows that they can choose right. whether to come and not have to ask. But I always will say, you know, when you're thinking about ASL, I would say, are you thinking about Spanish? What are the other languages yeah, that are Spanish. used in the oh. region? And, um, you know, when you're thinking about creating an environment where people who use ASL are gonna start trusting that this is something that you offer, how great to have that centered around a person who is deaf first, as opposed to the accommodation. Uh, if there is a person who's deaf who's like, you never have interpretation, I'd be like, join our board and we'll have it at every single meeting. Mm. So, and again, it's, it is a definitely push and pull. You know, I've had choruses reach out to me looking for interpreters uh, to join their chorus, but again, with no deaf patronage. And unless you're Sweet Honey in the Rock, where you've, you know, over the years created an experience that deaf people want to participate in and know that they can just show up and not have to worry about making a request, it, 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 it's an exchange and I, I can see both sides. Um, uh, like I said, I, I just think it's, uh, everyone always asks me when there are many other resources and I'm not deaf, so. 
you know, it's always something I wrestle with. I do have friends who are deaf, so this is where some of this conversation comes from. For you. Yeah, signs. I'm, I'm home signed. <laughs> so, and yeah. speaking I mean, of speaking of the the just sort of the natural flow of things, Charles, I just I did really notice how. Um, oh, you know, you make it seem effortless or instinctive, but how naturally you sort of weave in uh, descriptions of the visual imagery in your slideshow, which I think is, you know, as we all adapt to the changing um, environment in which we are having human conversations nowadays, you know, just being mindful of those things and, and not taking a picture for granted, you know, not taking a tune for granted and just, and just doing everything possible, I think, you know, or or even just making an attempt because you'll never do everything possible, but making that attempt as you as you share content to make it as to just to remove it, as many barriers as possible as you go. And you know, uh, I mean, I work in public education, and, and universal design for us is a is a major you know is is a major um, set of sort of instructional principles that we try to work with with folks on. And and just today, you know, I was listening to a math teacher talk about worksheets. You know, and he had done he had done some done something where he'd taken the formula. You know, you're trying to do a math worksheet, and you're hunting through a textbook, and you know, there's ten different formulas in the book, and so he just took the for, all the formulas the students would need and put it on the top of the worksheet. You know, and I said, what a what a brilliant way to just eliminate that barrier of of flipping around for no for no good reason. You know, that barrier that wasn't doing the kids any good to have to flip back and forth, back and forth. Um, and so I think you know, just it's just that simple sort of thought process of of eliminating barriers. Um, I, I wanted to uh, just say we do have a few people still in the participation participation booth, I suppose I would call it. I don't know. So so if folks want to uh, be be brought into the audience or if you have any questions that you want to just pop in through the chat, please don't hesitate to, to do that. Um, I just wanted to make that statement. And I'm glad uh, and again, invite anyone. Like I said, I don't have all the answers, but I always have something to say. Um, the I was happy that you mentioned the universal design for learning because I include that, but it's a full multi-hour session. And I tried to jump over that because it's 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 gonna be an all-day thing. Um, Massachusetts does, of course. Uh, I think they're now in Waltham, but maybe it's Wilburn. Uh, Cast the David Rose Group, which is of course number one, but more and more. Uh, schools and educators are recognizing um, how brains work and how brains absorb information. And uh, this is why I always like to bring it to folks in marketing and development departments, uh, because it really starts thinking about if I put out a press release or an ad, uh, it's going to have text. Uh, I'm not a fan of pictures of text because those aren't picked up by screen readers. I'm a fan of a picture and text and a logo and a description. And once you get into the habit, then uh, it becomes rote. Um, you know, creating alt text for your images shouldn't be like, oh, I've got 75 images on my website. How am I going to get it all done? Well, one, you want to get that done. But then as photos get added, it's just done naturally. Some alt texts are better than others. And that comes with practice as well. Um, you know, minimizing and getting to the essence of it. Um, in one of my sessions, we spent a long time talking about self descriptions. Um, in the theater, description is used to push the story along. Um, and obviously, you don't want to uh, over you don't want to oversound when someone's speaking. So it's, again, key visual elements that are going to push the story along. In the learning network I lead, which is about developing community, if that's the goal, the first session was a lot of people describing their visual self. Um, but as we've gone along, the visual self doesn't change that much, a hairstyle, a shirt, and the self-description has become one of how I'm feeling today, because that contributes to the community that we're developing. So it really gets tied to what are the goals of the meeting, the production, the, of the description. So you've seen us, I mean, you've seen us as a council sort of muddle our way through, you know, first we, we really did a lot of accessibility, like we, we did the logistics for folks, you know, grantees who are interested, we, 
you know, I mean, we, we couldn't do everything, but we did quite a bit when I look back, you know, at, in terms of coordinating those services, um, you know, and, and that was a relatively small amount of money, but a fairly significant amount of work to just, you know, the communication that goes into that and the, the scheduling. And, and so this year we've tried to um, integrate accessibility more into our guidelines and, you know, still set aside funds for, for grantees who are interested in, um, you know, funding services, but also try to, I guess, uh, provide the resources for them to find, to find services as opposed to, you know, doing it as a volunteer group ourselves. Um, if you have, if you have thoughts on, on what cultural councils can do, I guess, to, you know, to promote, and, and I, I really do prefer sort of Joy's broader, well, it's not just Joy's, but she has, she has been sort of our, our loudest voice, but the broader, you know, notion of, of cultural, racial, ethnic, gender, you know, just a broader concept of accessibility. Um, but just, just thoughts that you have on, on cultural councils that are doing, doing that well, or what you wish councils did more of? Um, well, I do think that, you know, again, this is human, this is human centered work. And so, uh, a lot of people and organizations have been doing racial equity work, which is so great. It starts thinking about the bias, the implicit and explicit biases that we carry within us because of the systems that we live in. How can you work your way through those? Uh, this certainly connects to ableism as well. Uh, how can you actually be honestly receptive to anyone who might show up? So I really do think um, staff training uh, or uh, self-education around these biases uh, can still be that number one, quote unquote, most affordable. Um, I think the other thing, and you even brought it up, is um, some little things like, uh, again, what's the difference between audio information and audio description? Uh, mm -hmm. You might have a headset that you can listen to and then you look at you know, each image and you're getting the, the painter and the era and the style, but audio description, particularly in a two-dimensional format, follows a certain formula. But what a wonderful thing to practice with, using words to describe an image. Um, but I would also say within that, the other piece is uh, with me, not for me. Um, make sure, uh, if you're trying to reach out to communities, invite them in or go to where they are. That's also key, you know, so much we get so in focused on, you know, come to my event, but it really has to be an exchange. And if you are practicing your audio description, great way to do that is to wander through a gallery with someone who uh, is blind or limited vision and hear their immediate reaction to the words that you're using. Um, so those are just some of the simple ideas and websites, which do cost money are super important. So how do we find to go to these groups? That has been one of our main questions. Um, that, some, that, I mean, we don't have a whole, we're all volunteer, we're all yeah. folks. So, you know, we've done a fair amount of work, but we're limited in terms of, you know, time and ability, but we have tried and with, I'd say, limited success that we need to reach out to more people and say, how can we get, you know, what can we do and um, how can we, you know, make it so that you want to apply for a grant to produce something and well as come to something and well, I might pull Ricky into this because he has a, a, a greater understanding of the local cultural councils, because my thought would be, you know, our, when you're putting out the call, like we've got this money, apply for our grant. Um, our, so you got money. So are you reaching artists who might be in uh, social service organizations? Are you reaching artists at the schools that accommodate kids mm -hmm. who are deaf? Um, you know, so that way, again, you start centering the human, um, which always has so much more human interest. Am yeah. I getting what the councils do right, Ricky? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so I guess before I should start, I should probably um, do the identification. So uh, Ricardo Guillaume, I'm on the Communities Initiative, the Mass Cultural Council. 
uh, working with cultural councils in Franklin County, South Central Mass, and uh, Barnesville County. Um, coming from Hyde Park, Boston, uh, which is original land of the Wampanoag. And um, I'm wearing a white sweater with black stripes, uh, short black hair, um, brown black glasses. Uh, my beard is coming in a little bit. <laughs> and I'm a, a black man, uh, 32. So uh, to answer the question, yeah, um, we've been having conversations with, um, you know, with the team and councils on how we can better asset map. And perhaps, you know, councils can, you know, build relationships with their municipalities and ask them for like data and kind of, you know, see, all right, this is who makes up our council and this is who makes up our community by zip code, by area, um, who are we missing? And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, small towns or rural towns can be predominantly white. Um, so in terms of diversity access, you know, are your council members different ages? Um, are they coming from, you know, different life experiences? Uh, you know, do they identify differently in terms of gender or um, pronouns? Or, you know, um, some people went to college or some people didn't, uh, men and women, um, things like that to make sure the council is more representative community. Um, so perhaps you could go and, you know, ask the town contact and like, you know, um, you know, give us different areas from the town and, you know, let's see who we can reach out to. And like Charles say, you know, go to the, the town halls, go to um, the table sessions, at, go to the school committees, um, ask to be put in your local paper. Uh, if you have a Facebook page, Instagram, social media is huge, things like that. And I think that's such a great point because I, I've certainly heard this before, you know, we don't have any diversity here. And uh, that, uh, you know, one, uh, I always like to bring up, uh, and I did it this time in my slideshow, but I'd like to bring up ecosystems because an ecosystem works uh, because of its diversity. And our, our, our human creative system works because of the diversity. So it's not about um, the percentage of people sometimes it really becomes the the what works best is when the diversity is all working together to make that system work so even if the percentages of indigenous americans is small there's a value to that inclusion um anyway i just i i think that uh, particularly when there is a, a deep desire to make change. Uh, we can get into a place where we want it to happen quickly. And uh, sometimes this change is incremental and to really, you know, again, change hearts and minds can take quite a while. Um, but my first thought would be, would be to find the creative practitioners uh, and then work around them. Um, you know, uh, Hartford School isn't too far away from where you guys are. I think I don't have a map in front of me. Um, but uh, Robin, you mentioned, you know, there are deaf musicians. There most definitely are. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, the idea of, of creating an event um, based on the artist often will bring in people that you may didn't realize were already your neighbors. Um, the schools, because you've got a lot of schools out there. So the schools might be having things that uh, are worth uh, going to uh, as a way. Well, part of that is the difference between meeting the local community versus meeting the school community. Um, so that has its own challenge. I would imagine not every 20 year old is a student, but <laughs> a lot of them. Well, well, we do have a lot of them, and it's it's funny that you bring that up. And this is totally unrelated, but but we've this year grappled Sorry. with and and explored, you know, expanding our um, student, you know, the the availability of our grants to students, you know, conditional on them um, engaging with the community. You know, I mean, you couldn't be yeah. just with the school system, but but I think our the you know the the university system. But I, I do think that's that's an important thing for us particularly here in Amherst, obviously, um, you know, to be mindful of is that some of the best diversity we have, best, you know, some, some much of the diversity that we have in this area is directly tied to the, to the colleges and university. Yeah, you must have a huge population that comes in and leaves. 30,000. So yeah, <laughs> harnessing that, that energy uh, really could be worthwhile as well. Absolutely. 
So Charles and, and others, I think, um, you know, I don't see any, any questions coming from the uh, audience, although, um, you know, we're really grateful to have them here. And I noticed that Representative Dom was in the audience, but I think she left before we, before we broke, so I didn't get a chance to say hello, but she's been a great supporter of ours and, and we're really grateful to, to her as well. Um, I, think, I think we might be at a point where we wanna kind of close it and, and definitely post this video for, um, for other councils and for, for certainly for our grantees if they're interested in accessing it. And as I said, we'll, we'll make sure to share um, the resources that Ricardo has been posting and um, you know, as much as we possibly can, we'll get onto our website so that folks can um, have access to it. Well, and really, if anyone, sometimes it takes a while to settle. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people that, I, you know, you sit in the presentation and people say, what are the questions? And I'm like, not yet. But right. in about 24 hours, I might have three questions. <laughs> so yeah. um, uh, anyone obviously here who comes up it can go through you. It can go through Ricky, who's in the communities department, and come directly to me. I'm, I'm happy to try to, you know, again, unpack some of the nuance. Uh, as, as Robin knows, I'm a great encourager. Um, the idea of uh, just get started and sometimes it's a baby step, but still an important step. So be happy to help. Okay. Rachel. Hi, Charles, that was really good. Thank you very much. And nice yeah. to meet you um, too, Ricky. Um, so I'm a council member here and the question I have is with regard to the um, statistics and data of whether it's performers or, or artists, I should say, um, or audience, are there, does the state have any statistics on the population by whether it's county or town or did you see what I mean? Like regarding certain... disability? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure they do. Um, in fact, the report that I hinted at the end, there's a couple of reports that come out of the Institute for Human Centered Design talking about the percentage of people, not only who identify as people with disabilities, but also uh, who exhibit disabilities. So we know that veterans are gonna identify as a veteran first, even though there may be a number of disabling conditions in their lives. But the, uh, the national statistic is one out of, you know, like I said, it's, it's uh, one out of, it's 20%, but in our urban areas where people with disabilities will go because there's more services, it often becomes uh, closer to, um, you know, a quarter of the population as opposed to a fifth. Um, there is data out there, all of the offices of disability have this data. Um, what happens is that so often disability, because of the success of that image, the figure in the wheelchair, people equate disability with someone who uses a wheelchair or a mobility device uh, and doesn't think about how I can't even see without my glasses, uh, but I don't consider myself disabled. That's the aging part of me. Um, so I don't think I'm on that statistic. If you're looking specifically for artists with disabilities, mm -hmm. uh, that's a whole different thing. Um, and I don't think anyone's tracking that. The Mass Culture Council, I think we've just this year starting to start collect demographic data on a voluntary basis. I, I think it's really important what you, oh, sorry, Robin. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say it's very important. I, it certainly kind of opened up my thinking a lot just by um, using the term functional limitations mm -hmm. because Yes, I have my glasses. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to tell you how loud the sound of my computer is. Never mind. Never right. Mind. No. And then I think my first question, um, as you were running through your slides, was, well, does did, did, did the people come first? Do the accommodations come first? And then that came up in one of the you know subsequent slides. And I guess it sounds like it's something that we, um, as a community, need to figure out by trial and error and just maybe, you know, doing some exploratory pilot projects that are intended to help us figure out how to um, just use access as a, as a standard, right? Maximum access as a standard um, 
so that's so I just want to thank you for for the presentation and and you know and Joy and Robin for helping us get Charles and Ricky here. Thank you. I did that. <laughs> but, so Charles, do you know if um, like England has um, data on artists with disability? Because I know stuff. It's weird because you know TikTok comes on Facebook, and I I'm a little bit of an addict at this point. But um, there was this, came up this thing about these. I think this was in the 80s maybe or 90s it was a while ago where there was this whole strike to shut down the transit system in London to make it accessible um and I think there was a movie made out of it and it was like a really well-known thing and this push and these were um performing artists as well and so it, it, they seem to be a little ahead of us, or maybe it's just I happen to see, you know, that there are, there's a radio program on it and there's, you know, blogs that I'm just not seeing here, which doesn't mean we don't have them or they have more, but. No, but you're so right. As soon as you said that, of course, I was like, oh. You I, thought I, I you know what I'm talking I about. I have homework right? after the meeting. So I was like, oh, I wonder, because they just might have that kind of data. Yeah. Well, I am a researcher, so well, how and even how an artist how you how do you define an artist? Um, I have, and you may have heard this. I really purposely try to say creative practice because I also think the word sometimes artist is a barrier. People will be like, "Well, I don't paint," because that's all an artist does. You know, I'm out in the field mm -hmm. painting a picture of lilies, and yet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I live in an artist collective and I'm always trying to push this idea of creative practice. You know, as more coders and digital designers come in, that's creative. I don't know how they do it, but that's <laughs> it. And uh, anyway, so naturally I can wrestle with the term, but I am gonna look that up, Robin, and I'll let you know if I find it. Yeah, well, if I, I have it somewhere if I find it easily, but artists, I think is, self, is a self-defined term. I mean, I don't do any of that stuff but my stagecraft is art. It's very different than the way other people stage manage. And I've been told on every level, and it is to me an art because I have to create it and do it in a certain way and very intentionally. So, but I can't paint, I can't sing. I, but you can stage manage. I'm just adding you to a list. Stage Rob. manage in a way that is-, is really Like a good stage manager, like Robin. <laughs> oh yeah, no, well, I don't know how much I can do with these days, but um, just, it's also to find what we need in terms of ability, what, what I thought of is so, I had the physical therapist and I was saying, you know, I, I, I can no longer run and nobody will tell me why I can no longer run, but I would like to be able to run because it's a lot more important than you think in terms of safety. And because um, I have a spinal cord injury and I can't run since then. Um, I mean, literally run. So she said, you know, there are these people I have who they want to function and their functioning is that they need to be able to run to catch a bus. And, and because they're also walking more slowly, they miss the buses a lot. And, and it's a significant disability for them because other people can do it. You know, and, and like if they're in New York City, you have to be able to run to get the bus. Um, and so there's a whole different, you know, concept of what it means to be disabled, but to function in their lives, these people need to be able to run and they couldn't before. I mean, they could before and now they can't because of whatever reason, usually stuff that happens with aging. Um, and everybody knows aging and my incredibly healthy friends are having, you know, hearing is going down or they've got cataracts and they can't drive at night or, you know, their hips are being replaced or they just make a little fall and they rip their you know rotator cuff i mean we're all as long as you assume you live long enough are going to have various disabilities meaning our cohorts could do it or we need to be able to do it um and we can't in the way the world is you know we can't do something we need to do or want to do and the people around us are able to. Our so, expectations are different. We live longer yep. and I, longer. 
plan to rock out until I can't anymore. Mm-hmm. Well, invite us to the party. Parties. 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 Right. I see your hand is up. Um, this is probably going to be a bigger, uh, too big of a question for this panel, but it does lead me to a more focused one. So bear with me. Um, kind of on the, you know, going off of the definition of an artist, um, you know, and, and the idea that some people don't think of themselves as artists because they don't do a specific thing, right. you know, so like kind of keeping that in mind as, as well as, you know, this larger conversation, like what is the biggest challenge to accessibility in the arts and how are we going to try to think about it? And then the more focused question is, what is our role as a cultural council in trying to shape this conversation? Yeah. So is it like, do we, and this may help focus the fall panel, which I'm sadly not going to be a part of um, because I'm moving away from Amherst. Um, you, can still, you can still come to- I can come. Um, <laughs> so you can say things. And... <laughs> but like, so in our role as a cultural council, like are we like trying to come up with a guidebook and a set of guidelines for people to think about? Or is it like, are we trying to like set in place, you know, opportunities for people to think about the idea of art? What is art? What makes an artist? And what then, how do you bring that to the table? Like, what is it in you that you could um, add to this cultural conversation, even if you don't think you're an artist? You know what I mean? So that that's a that's a whole like, what are we doing? <laughs> I go, go to that panel discussion, Joy. <laughs> <laughs> so don't leave until you have it. it there's good. a seat. There's a seat with your name on it, Charles. What, what, uh, whatever, whatever this. Trust me, you're 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 more than invited. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really. Yeah, go ahead, Charles. No, I was just going to say, and, and I'm sure Ricky has more to say. You know, the role of the Cultural Council, either as helping define or reacting. I, I, I don't have a, a real sense. And I would imagine you're wrestling with that in the department. Yeah, I was thinking maybe it starts by um, just trying to demystify everything, you know, um, making the term artists just be less like intimidating or, you know, the whole art world or art culture letting people know that they can be a part of it in different ways that, you know, works for them. I think the agency is trying to make sure that staff and the board is representative of the Commonwealth as a well, whole, and that, you know, grantees and people who are reaching out to us see our staff pages and they see people who look like themselves. So they know that, you know, once we're evaluating their grants or when cultural councils are evaluating their grants, it's, it's like of a community um, who looks like them. And I think that's maybe the first step um, and kind of letting people know that, yeah, art is like, I don't know, in the eye of the beholder, it's not just painting and singing and dancing, you know. Julia? Yeah, I think from the many conversations the council had, it really has had, it comes from a point of being open in many ways, you know, tonight we are opening the conversation and encouraging conversation. We want to make sure that events are open and welcoming. We want to make sure that people are open to the dialogue that needs to happen. Um, you know, we can fund projects, but if we aren't considering that they're open and welcoming, why are we doing it? So I think, you know, to, to really try to <laughs> distill down a huge concept, whatever we can do, to keep people open and welcoming and, and considerate and helpful to others is at the heart of it. Well, and you know, these are conversations we are having at the council. I think we had a staff meeting the other day and we never got to a sense of what is public value. And yet um, that really is tied into this. You know, the, the creative expression that needs to be shared, um, does it exist without the public? Does it exist without the audience? And what is that exchange between the viewer and the creator. But like I could talk about this all night, so you better wrap me up. <laughs> well, I, and I hate be, because unfortunately that does raise some of the biggest challenges that we that we face, which are, you know, even though this is a in the world in the big world of art grants and culture grants, this is a fairly 
loose. It is a fairly loose system, though, that the cultural councils run, you know, compared to some of these hundred page applications that people fill out, you know, and yet if you're not, if you don't live in this world of, you know, filling in the right boxes and using the right verbiage and all that, it's, it's extremely daunting for, for folks. And, and, you know, we've had conversations, uh, unfortunately, more conversations after an application is submitted mm -hmm. than before. Um, but, you know, I think for me, for me, and that's a very simplistic take on, I think, I mean, you know, what are we trying to do with, with this, this um, allotment of state funds that we have, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to enrich the cultural life of the town in a representative fashion, you know, I mean, that's, that's, I think, one of the simplest things that you can say. And, you know, I, I do worry about this every time we have a grantee who is clearly not meeting expectations, either in the in the upfront paperwork or the after the fact paperwork. I always worry that that there is a, a cultural sort of just a, a cultural barrier or an experiential barrier, you know, somebody who just is not raised in, in a in a household or in a lifestyle where this stuff is, um, you know, I mean, for and of course they're surrounded by college professors and their children. So, you know, for, for many of them, this is just sort of the bread and butter of life. Um, so, so for me, one very basic, concrete, tangible, you know, thing that we can accomplish and um, around access is to have a richer dialogue before the grant submissions happen. I would, I wish we were talking to, you know, if we're talking to one person before and ten people after, you know, mm -hmm. if that's the, if that's the ratio, let's say, I wish we could just flop that ratio and just have ten people coming to a workshop. And we've done our, you know, we've done in person and virtual in advance trying to be as as open as we can. So for me, that's a very small but but I think meaningful metric is, you know, how many people are am I helping enter the grant portal as opposed to, you know, navigate their way through the <laughs> through the grant portal after they've after they started to struggle, you know. Um, is the application itself accessible is what you're saying to yeah. people who don't come from that experience or mindset or reference point as well as language and yeah. everything else and we've had a lot of these conversations and i think as matt said it's um afterwards but we also spend a significant amount of um focus and effort when we think that's happening to someone to speak to them and try to you know, figure out what it is they meant to say and what it is they meant to do and and how we're not saying it in a way that makes sense to them. Um, and hopefully, as I say, we can, you know, have that happen less often on the after end and figure it out on the initial end. But I think part of that is the application is not that easy. I almost wonder if we just print the thing. Could we just print it and put stacks of it at the library and the post? You know what I mean? Just, just have. You do like fill it out in dummy examples. No, and then we transcribe it for them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, I'm just. That's a stretch, but but you know, I I mean, geez, I I just think about school kids. You know, and yeah, they're all digital natives, but click 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 all that clicking and typing and clicking and typing. You know, people get burned out um interacting that way um yeah i think um it's something we're like having constant conversations about because we introduced a new system this year mm -hmm. and um we knew there was going to be um i guess you know trials and error and uh, i think we put out a survey to councils who finished and we're you know anticipating that feedback to make it better because you know there are because it's government there are certain like boxes you have to check for legal purposes but with that said our executive director, Michael, is big on this. And we all agree that it should be very easy. The language should be simple. It should take like five minutes or less um, to, you know, and minimize as, as much clicking as possible with regards to working with this within this like legal state government, you know, statute frame. And yeah, you know, um, there's definitely room for improvement. And we're going to be having those conversations. Um, yeah, I, just, I love it. I mean, I, I love I love the smart set. You know, it's a wonderful system. And, and I found this is my first you know year on, behind the scenes. And it really is extremely accessible, um, you know, for, for those of us who are sort of natives in that world. But um, and, and so I don't think any you know, I think it's, it's less about sort of the particulars of the online and more about just sort of 
folks uh, just, you know, just, just navigating that much information. Um, so, you know, but I, I think that's a, that's a conversation for us as a council to keep having. And, and, you know, we, we certainly make the best efforts we can to, to have our public meetings be accessible and straightforward. And, and, you know, I think we did an afternoon and an evening session this time. And I, and we offered, we may not have offered in person just because of COVID, but, but certainly that's, that's on the table is, is to do it in person and more workshop format. Um, so, so always areas to grow in, that's for sure. Well, I'm going to take this note to say, well, I've been zooming for a long time today. <laughs> yeah. I'm well, going to get off the zoom, but it's been a real pleasure to share space with you again, and and really based on the work that we did last year together. I, I, I appreciate it. And uh, again, reach out to me based on any questions that you have. Um, reach out to Ricky and make him do answer the questions we're at it but but part of it is that you know working access touches everything and so i'm always willing uh, to help and ricky thank you so much for coming today because i knew that um, yeah. <laughs> i didn't I, I like to say i know every department but i really don't so um, i'm uh, happy to come and help you know i know you guys miss mina i can't <laughs> you know, fill her shoes but do my best Thank you both so much. It's nice to put yeah. in a face with the name. Is Carolyn Cole still here? She is. Yeah. Is, yeah. 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 Our new teammate, Carolyn. Should invite, oh. Let's invite her in before I go off because I haven't had a chance to meet her. Can we make her a panelist? Does she have to request it? I've invited her. Carolyn. Here I am. Hi. <laughs> but, uh, hi I get an official Mass Cultural Council greeting to you. So nice <laughs> to meet you, Carolyn. I, you know what? I learned so much tonight. Uh, Charles, what? you are just such a talented individual. The way you you phrase things in a way that really gets people thinking completely, not even outside the box, but outside the the galaxy. Oh, cool. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this was really, really insightful. And I have my my five year old here. She's learning with me. So <laughs> excellent. Well, hopefully for her, this will be a norm and not something we have to add. Exactly. I'm bringing it Robin. Nice. Very and nice. I look forward to meeting you all in the Amherst. I look forward to making a trip down there and and seeing you all in person. <laughs> are you are a regional person. I am a the new cultural districts program officer. Yeah. It means but, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I work with cultural districts and, and a few of the local cultural councils. And honestly, I just love people. So um, you'll just see me hopping about the state over the next <laughs> few years. <laughs> um, and, 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 and what is it like day, day three, Carolyn? So Yes, it feels like uh, year three. <laughs> I'm, I'm completely immersed in this, but I love it. I love every second of it. So you're working with the cultural districts of which Amherst has one. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for letting me invite you in. I, it was an opportunity for me to meet you, which I appreciated very much. So. Yeah. Oh, I'm so. Thank you for having me. Honestly, this was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, well, reach out to your cultural district. I am going to uh, head out. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, Robin, always a pleasure. Um, yeah, we'll 